we hope that you know that we're a, we're a church family that accepts you for who you are, but we love you so much that uh, we're not going to leave you there, okay? We want to see God do an awesome work in your life. We want to see him do the miraculous in your life, your family, and just, man, just to lead you and guide you well. Today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2 as we continue with, Who Stole My Christmas? Jesus was an amazing storyteller, and he told lots of parables. In the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you can read stories that Jesus told. He took common things of the day, and he shared what could happen in that that just common uh, practice of the day, whether it was being a shepherd or being a parent or whatever it might have been, a farmer. And he would make a spiritual truth. He would bring about a spiritual truth so that the people could apply it to their lives. And we're taking that same, that same idea, that same idea of a parable, and we're using the story, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, and we're drawing some things, not necessarily from that story, but from Scripture that connect to that story that can apply to our lives. So before we jump into the Grinch, let's jump into Luke chapter two. And here's what your Bible says in verse one. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Get the picture here. The ruling power wants to number the amount of people. So they're telling everybody, we are going to take a census. The word went out, and the people are to respond. Verse three, and everyone went to their own town to register. So that means people go back to where they were born. It means there's a lot of movement. There's, I mean, think about it. People are, are, are taking their entire families and going back to their mother town, motherland, okay, where they, where they were born. So there's just lots of movement. I'm sure a deadline was given. I'm sure that they had to bring so many things with them of identification. And Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, he honors what the government is asking him to do. And here you can see in verse 4. So so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth, that's where he was living, in Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. Verse five, Joseph went there to register with Mary, Jesus' mom, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So she is expecting this baby, okay? She is like, she's nine months into this thing and she's like, Joseph, we gotta do what? I'm about to have the baby, okay? I can just hear the conversation. Verse six, while they were there, so they get to Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So here's the scene. They're 90 miles from where they need to be. Joseph does not call ahead and make a reservation. They have no cars The mode of transportation of that day was walking. From Nazareth to Bethlehem would have taken up to six days to walk if you weren't pregnant. And here she is, and those of you in the room, those of you watching online, you've carried a baby full term. You're like, ain't no way I'm walking 90 miles in six days, right? But that's what the government had decreed. So Joseph takes her and they get there and there's no room. There's no guest house. There's no Airbnb. No Holiday Inn Express. But it's time to have the baby. I can't imagine the conversation and the frustration and the busyness of Bethlehem. All the hustle and bustle. I mean, there was no room for them. It means everybody was there. It doesn't give us description, but I wonder what it looked like the next day in the market. People trying to find food, people checking out, people checking in. I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was pretty chaotic. And the people of Bethlehem 
had no idea the magnitude of the birth that would take place that night. They had no idea. Wrapped up in the hustle and bustle of what they were doing. Selling, cleaning, getting ready for their day, doing their jobs. In their busyness and preparations, they missed the joy of the birth of the Savior, which would have been the only thing, at least the most important thing, that was happening that night. The hustle and bustle of the census caused so many to miss the joy of the season. As we follow in our book, uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which I, I can't remember when it was written, but the first movie was produced in 1966, and then I think it was 2001 or something when Jim Carrey came on the scene as the Grinch, and then there was a fun animated one just uh, in 2018. But if you've watched the Jim Carrey version, okay, which is the best version, okay, all right, you talk to some millennials and they're like, we hate it, it's dumb, it doesn't make any, we don't like it, you know, they like the cartoon version better, I don't, I don't know why. But the opening scene, it's the credits, the Whoville people are busy, they are shopping, they are moving, they're, they're spending money so fast that the cashier's like, don't you want your change? Like, I don't have time. I mean, they're just dropping money and leaving. They're bustling outside, and of course, Cindy Lou and her dad, and last week we got visited by Cindy Lou, and she made the comment, doesn't all just seem so superfluous, you know, unnecessary, you know? People seem so combobbled or clobobbled or whatever she said. She made up a who word. A guy comes out in the middle of the, of the, of the town, and all this is going on, and he yells out, Hats for sale, 99% off. And everybody just blitzes into his store as if now everybody needs a hat, okay, to add on to everything that's going on. These people, what were they doing? They were spending money they didn't have to impress people they don't even know. And maybe people that they don't even, that they don't even like. The hustle and bustle causes the people of Who Bill to miss out on the point of Christmas focuses on everything except the real meaning of Christmas. They're running around so frazzled as if the joy of Christmas had been stolen from them as well. And this is part of the reason why Cindy Lou asked the question last week, what's Christmas really all about? And I shared with you last week, Jesus is the reason for the season. Adam, are you wearing your shirt? Did you wear it today? Jesus is the reason for the season? You don't have it, all right. He wore it last Sunday night at the prayer. That was awesome. That's great, but that is the point. I want, to, I want to encourage you today, don't let the trappings and the hustle and bustle of the season push out the joy of Christmas. We are in danger of that. In America, we are a busy society. And probably the greatest killer of your joy is your busyness. Because your busyness creates stress, creates a chaotic feeling inside of us. And it causes us to miss out on the joy. My family had the joy of Christmas stolen from us the other morning. It was just a brief little bump in the road, so it wasn't, wasn't that tragic. In my home, um, I get the pleasure of setting up our artificial Christmas tree. Yeah, I, I heard some guys, oh. <laughs> you have to like open every branch on that thing and every twig and put that thing in. And I do it huffing and complaining the entire time. Yeah, I may be a Christian, but I am a human first, okay? Just let me let you, I'll just tell you that. All right, Lord, crucify this flesh daily. Help me to walk in the Spirit. I love this Christmas tree. <laughs> so I do my duty, I do my part. Put all the lights on it, and I'm done. Plug it in, beautiful, just glowing just lights. My wife's the decorator. And she puts all the bulbs and all the extra, these cool branches that look like they're Christmassy and a lot of other Christmassy things on the tree. And she's got these glittery cursive words that she hangs, uh, words like hope and love and joy and peace. And this is what our Christmas tree would look like. Here it is right here. This is one of the words right there, joy. I took that picture <laughs> on my iPhone 11. Look at that, it's beautiful. This is, so that's one of the words, that's the word joy. Um, this is the word that got stolen from us, and this is where I found it the next day. This next picture, right there. Our dog wanted to get in on the action. 
and he ate joy. <laughs> and I was annoyed. I was very annoyed. I cleaned it up. We have, we have glitter all over our yard now. Okay. Let that, give you a second to let that sink in. It's easy to allow circumstances that don't go our way to steal our joy. It's easy for that to happen. When something happens to us that frustrates us, causes us stress, we can be quick to give up the joy and embrace the frustration, the busyness, the loneliness, the anger, whatever it might be. Christmas season can, can feel joyless sometimes. And there are many reasons why Christmas joy can be stolen from us. We get halfway through December and we're already tired of the songs. <laughs> tired of the busyness of hitting different parties. The decorations maybe are falling or for some losing their luster. Maybe for some of you, uh, your bank account and credit cards are showing signs that you may be in trouble after the first of the year. <laughs> Any of these, and even with these influences, um, they can become thieves. And the joy of Christmas can be stolen from us, but I want to encourage you, it doesn't have to. The joy of Christmas does not have to be stolen from you. You don't have to give it up. You don't have to give it, give it away. I want to share three ways, three quick ways to keep the joy of Christmas from being stolen from us this year. I want you to write these down, okay? It's real simple. The first one starts with J, it starts with O, and the third one starts with, hey, you guys knew where I was going, good job. Joy, Jay, the first one. The first way to keep the Christmas joy from being stolen from you this year and above everything else is keep Jesus first. Keep him number one. Don't, don't get too busy on Jesus' birthday for Jesus. On Jesus' birthday, don't be so wrapped up. Be careful that you don't get so wrapped up in everything going on that you miss him. Keep Jesus first. He's who Christmas is all about. Last week we did answer that question that Cindy Lou had. She's like, Santa, what is Christmas really about? And we learned it's not vengeance, <laughs> and it's not presence. We discovered that, to quote myself from last week, we discovered that Christmas is more than celebrating a holiday. It's more than taking time to decorate a tree or the house or even spending time with family. It's about a lost humanity that has tried to figure out life on its own and a savior king who has come to the earth to establish a relationship with you. It's an opportunity to pause and give thanks for the love, hope, and joy found in Jesus. It's about him. When we keep Jesus first, we, we won't lose our joy. So what can we do? How do what, what can we do to keep Jesus first? I got a couple things for you. First, Read the biblical account of the Christmas story on your own and with your family. I looked it up. I counted the number. There are about 60 verses in the Christmas story. If you skip through so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so in Matthew 1. So if you need to know where to go, Matthew 2, Luke chapter 2. I can guarantee you that when my family gets together, on Christmas Day in Granger, Indiana, with my mom and dad, my dad is going to sit on his little swivel chair. He's going to have probably a Christmas t-shirt on. He's going to have a red hat on, and he is going to open up to Luke chapter 2 and read in the King James Version, okay? That's what my dad's going to You know how I know he's going to do that? Because that is what he has always done. Before we eat, before we open gifts, before we talk about and cry over what we're thankful for, before we play any games, my dad has us sit down in a circle and he reads us the Christmas story because he knows that Jesus needs to be first. And he wants to remind us and instill in us. So guess what I do as a dad? I pull out the New Living Translation <laughs> and with my own kids, I do the same thing. We do the same thing. It's important Spiritual leader of your home, elbow nudged to you. Those of you in this room, those watching online, doesn't matter how old you are. 
If you're a Christian and no one else is leading, you be the spiritual leader then. Pull the family together and just ask, hey, could I read Luke chapter two, the biblical account of Christmas, and read it with your family? Help them keep Jesus first. If you have, if you have little kids, it's, don't pull out the King James and read to your little kids, okay? I mean, if you got little preschoolers, little elementary kids, Maybe get a, something their age and start there. If they're in middle school, maybe have them draw, write something. Hey, let's draw it. Or, or hey, I remember being a junior higher. Those figures in the t- nativity, oh, you can move them around and they can do a lot of crazy things. All right, shepherds up on top of the roof. All right, wise men crawling under the hay, you know, you know, trying to get to the baby Jesus. Let them get involved. If you've got high schoolers or college age, let them read it. Give it to them. Train them. Here's another way to keep Jesus first. Use a Christmas devotional for your personal quiet time. Now, I do this, that's what I've been doing. I actually found one. Uh, um, I Hate Christmas is the one I read this last week. It looks just like our Who Stole My Christmas, and it's, it's pretty good. I actually started counting how many Christmas devotionals there were. Just in the search, put Christmas. I stopped at 207, and there was just page after page after page. You are without excuse. Download the YouVersion Bible app and grab yourself some devotionals to help you keep Jesus first this Christmas season. Here's another one. Attend church services that creatively emphasize Jesus at Christmas. You're here. Give yourself a round of applause. You're doing it. This is great. I mean, seriously. All right. And those of you that didn't clap, you were forced to be here, but thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Now, there's something about being, being in an environment that helps keep the story fresh, that, that, that tries to look, new, look for new ways to present a 2,000-year-old story that is very important and relevant for today. Be a part of our Christmas Eve service. It's, it's got to be, I don't know, the most inspiring, um, meaningful service of the entire year, maybe outside of maybe Easter. But man, come 6 o'clock Christmas Eve and be with us. It's going to be beautiful. Doing those types of things helps keep Jesus first and it keeps the joy. Here's the last one I'll give you here real quick. Thank Jesus daily for what you have. Nothing will shift how you feel and how you think about life, about your current circumstances, if you would take five minutes and just pause for a moment of silence and solitude and just God, I'm thankful. God, I'm thankful for my wife. She loves you. Man, she could, she could love so many other things, but she loves you. And she loves me. God, thank you for my family. They're healthy. My kids are healthy. Thank you for what you're doing in the life of my son, Max. God, just thank you for, for touching my family. God, thank you. We have a good home, and Lord, when the furnace had an issue a couple months back, it was a quick fix, and we didn't have to spend thousands of dollars. God, thank you. You see what I'm saying? You just take a moment. If you will stop for a moment, if you set a timer for five minutes, you'll be like, oh, I'm not done yet. And it shifts something in you. When you keep Jesus first, it changes your emotions. It changes the chemical makeup of your entire body. And it sets you right and you walk away with joy. So there, I gave you a few ways to keep the joy as you keep Jesus first. This is the second one. The second way to keep the joy of Christmas from being stolen this year is by keeping others second. Jesus first, others second. Philippians 2, I heard this verse, I think, a couple times this week. I think, Pastor Barry, I think you shared this in a couple sermons with uh, the funerals this week. I think, I think. No, this is the wrong one. I read, I read chapter four later. <laughs> this is chapter two. You didn't use these. Verses three and four in Philippians two says this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't, don't be prideful. Don't be selfish. It's saying don't do those types of things that would be driven by that. Rather, in humility, and I have this underlined, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So how do I do that? 
how do I take this verse, which actually, if we could just practice this, if we could memorize this verse, get it into our lives, allow it to play out in our day to day, we'd turn the, up, we'd turn the world upside down for Jesus. It would just be incredible. So how, how, here's a couple ways to do this this Christmas season. Give to the projects in our Christmas miracle offering and help us impact the world. There's something that God has done for us by opening up our eyes to what's really going on in the rest of the world. The gospel deficiency in areas of the world where people have never, ever heard about Jesus. Man, getting to give to that, I think is huge. I mean, great, there are local things and we will continue to give to that. But what we do in December by giving to the miracle offering, I, I get excited about. I've already told Rhonda what I wanna give and she's, she's down with it. She's, she's always looking for me to lead and she's like, I think you said let's go. I think you gave me, double, now you're on the spot. So, okay, everybody saw you need, nod your head. All right, all right, there you go. Awesome. Give to that project, give to things. Here's another one. We tend to give to those in our family and closest to us, but who can we bless who's outside of the norm? What about a neighbor? Even that neighbor that frustrates you. That little Christmas card, that silly Christmas card with that $5, you know, gift card in it that says, hey, go get something sweet because you're not, something like that would be. (laughs) Okay, don't say it like that, all right? Maybe before you write something in it, read Philippians chapter two, verses three and four, okay? Or what about, you know, what about like an ambulance worker or something? You see them, you know, man, have a couple gift cards on yourself that, you know, they can go to Dunkin' Donuts and get something or they can go to Panera or something. I mean, what a blessing it does. I mean, you're just putting them first. I've, I've paid for police officers' meals before and I remember one time I was at the Penn Station on DuPont and there was a police officer behind me. And I'm like, oh, I got his mail for sure, you know. So I pay for mine, and then I slide my car. I go, hey, when he comes up here, dude, just put it right on that right there, you know. I mean, he's walking, he's getting his meal, and it's just watching him. And he's ordering, and I'm like, oh, if he knew I was, it, his meal was going to be paid for, he probably would have went the larger size. And, you know, oh, he should have said yes to the cookies, you know, when they offer those. And, and uh, he gets up there, and, and uh, he's like, don't I pay? And he's like, no, the guy right here took care of it for you. And he, and he goes, he goes, Oh, I hate it when people do this for me. And I heard what he was saying, right? He loves it, but he feels embarrassed. And I was like, man, thank you for all that you do. I can't imagine your job. And I'll just, just say thank you and we'll be on with it. He's like, thanks, man. He's like, I really appreciate that. And I was like, I mean, I'm like, I was excited over doing that for him. And it wasn't just because I paid for his meal. As he's coming down that line, I'm feeling the excitement. Like he has no idea what's coming, you know? I'm just... I was probably more excited over it than he was, okay? But I walked out and I'm like, man, I hope that made his day. I hope he takes what I did and talks to another police officer about that. I hope he takes that home and tells his family that there are people in the community that respect, honor, and bless our police officers. Man, I, just, I hope that's what happened. I felt good about it and I hope that he did. I hope that he did too. How about, here's another one. Just serve in a, in, a, in a way not the norm for you. I told you a couple of times, Sophia and I, we, we rang bells for Salvation Army like two years ago. And um, it, it was just so great. People hearing the bells and I know, it's, to me it's kind of like receiving the offering on Sundays. You know what's coming, okay? When the person gets up here and we gotta be, would you give, all right? You know, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is, and I mean, we're ringing those bells and some people not even looking at us. And I've shared this with you before, and I just want to keep complimenting you and just, it's a little pastor pride here in a good way, all right? Proud moment of every person from First Assembly who came up there gave. It was, it was awesome. We had our, we had, I think we had masks on at the time or scarves or something, and not everybody could see us, but man, I was just proud of you. And I'm like, God, thank you. Thank you that there are people, Christian people, who continue to think of others first. They give, they bless, and if you don't want Christmas, the joy of Christmas stolen from you, put others second. Acts chapter 20, verse 35 says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. There's just that good feeling of giving. Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25, I use this verse a lot. A generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. If you refresh other people, if you keep Jesus first and others second, as you refresh them, there's a refreshing that comes back to you. 
Now, Proverbs was written thousands of years ago. But just recently, in the last probably 10 years, scientists and uh, doctors have realized that when you give to somebody, especially somebody who's close to you, it kicks oxytocin into your system. Now, the difference between oxytocin and dopamine is this. When you, when you hit something, you know, like working out, not, okay, not, not somebody, but something, or you're jogging, let's go there, or lifting weights, you know, you're working out, it, it, it fills you because there's a dopamine hit in your brain. An oxytocin hit lasts longer than a dopamine hit. And here's the reason that they say why. Because when you do something for someone or you give somebody something, there's a relational component, there's a social component that is handcuffed to that moment and to those chemicals in your body that creates between the two of you a trust and an an affinity that the dopamine hit doesn't do. And it lasts longer. Folks, we are just discovering this in this, in this uh, century. God knew this thousands of years ago. And he put it in a little phrase. I'm going to read it again. Proverbs 11, 25. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be filled with oxytocin. All right? Will be refreshed. They'll be refreshed. And if you, if you want to keep the joy at Christmas. Put people second. Keep Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. That's the third one. The third way to keep the joy of Christmas from being stolen from you this year is by placing yourself last. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says, no one should seek their own good, but the good of others. That's a verse that we've shared before. You've probably read that many times. We're not to seek our own good, but the good of others. This doesn't mean not yourself never, okay? God's not calling you to be a martyr to the point that you hate life. You got to take care of yourself. You have to take care of yourself. Keeping your, but keep yourself in the right position in the equation. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. So what does this look like? Well, in our family, it looks like this. Once Thanksgiving hits, you don't buy yourself anything. So we don't buy ourselves anything once Thanksgiving hits. And that is hard because, man, you get on Amazon and you start making your Christmas list so people know what to buy. And, man, it just goes like 5, 10, 15, 20. I mean, the, the, I mean, the gifts just add up. And I'm like, man, nobody's going to buy me that. I could buy that. I could buy me that. It, I mean, because the temptation's there. I mean, you're all stirred up because you've seen all these things and people are going to buy for you. And you're like, man, if I buy this, I'll definitely get it. Max, the other day, he was scrolling through and he a, he's a, uh, plays instruments and he saw, he was looking, uh, looking at some bass guitars uh, through Sweetwater and he kept narrowing it down. He's like, dad, dad, look at this. Which one? I could buy myself one. He works at Subway and he's like, he's got the money. And we're talking I'm like, dude, I don't know if you should do that. It's after Thanksgiving, man. This season, we don't buy ourselves things. And he came back to me later, and I think it was the next day, and I asked him, hey, man, did you get that guitar? He goes, no, man, I didn't get it. I was like, way to go. Jesus first, other second, yourself last. Is he in the room? Where is he at? He's where? Somewhere. Sorry, Max. We're not buying you the bass. Sorry. (laughs) You were a little too late on on that. We are sorry, man. (laughs) After Christmas, right? He'll probably buy it after Christmas. But it's the idea that, man, this is not about me time. This is about other people time. And I need to give them the opportunity to bless me. Here's another one. This is for us. To keep our joy so it's not stolen. Thinking about ourselves last. We still have to slow down by keeping a schedule. Slow down to a pace of grace, a schedule that we can handle. There's a lot of things we could do between Thanksgiving and Christmas, parties and events going on and things. I mean, we've got to, I mean, there's shopping and decorating and baking and visiting family members. It it can get nuts. And that busyness can rob your joy. It can feel so overwhelming. What we like to do 
is get our days on paper. And if we can look and see what's happening when, it brings peace to our days. There's a lot of people in my home, and we need to get it set. And when we do that, it gives us peace. Busyness is the enemy of joy. And the devil knows that if he can't get you to sin, he'll keep you busy. And slowly, your joy will just be stolen away. It'll be sucked right out of you. A pace of grace, slow down. I'm going to challenge you with this one too. Worship team, you can come out. Greet everyone you meet with a smile. This is like the easiest time of the year for Christians to make an impact. And if we're too busy, if we're too in a hurry, and we're all grumpy trying to get to here and there, and made me set up the Christmas tree, now I gotta go hunt down gifts, you know? Can't even buy myself something. I mean, that's, what is that? That's horrible, there's no joy there. Say thank you to people, you know? I mean, tell them Merry Christmas. When they say Happy Holidays, you can go Merry Christmas, you can slide that right in there, you know? They're trying to be PC. I'm trying to be JC, okay? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. Get that Merry Christmas in there. Be intentional. Be intentional with those. Be intentional with, about silence and solitude as well. This keeps you focused on the main thing or the main things. It refreshes your soul, your mind, and your emotions. Jesus had a habit of breaking away from the daily routines so he could just center himself refresh his soul. We would benefit from keeping a daily quiet time as well, to be grateful and thankful and to rest our minds. And here's the verse that Pastor Barry shared a couple times this week. Philippians 4, 8. It is the joy verse of the entire Bible. Here's what it says. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We have the opportunity for the next couple of weeks to think about a lot of things. And I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray that your eyes would be open to those things that are lovely, that are right pure, that are praiseworthy, that are admirable, so that your mind can stay right, so that your emotions can stay right, so your soul can stay right, so that you don't lose the joy of Christmas. If you would just take a moment to reflect on the message today, and I just want to pray over you, but before I do, I'm just going to give you about 30 seconds of solitude and silence. I'm just going to ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to calm you where you need calm, to center you where you need centered, to get your focus right if that's necessary, to shake off things that don't need to be there in your mind, in your life. I just want to give you know, about 30 seconds and then I'll pray. pray. Lord, I think one of the reasons that people enjoy Christmas so much is because the focus comes off of ourself pretty often, pretty easily for most, I would think. We put our resources and our affection and our time, energy towards other people. And Lord, that is so necessary if we're going to hang on to the joy of Christmas. God, I pray against anything that would get in the way of us keeping people second. Lord, if we put them first, there's a danger there. If we put them last, there's also a danger there. Help us to love people this holiday season. God, help us to be quick to smile and 
say Merry Christmas and have a word of affirmation to build others up. And Lord, help us to keep ourselves in the right spot in that equation. Ourself last, but not at the not at the point of neglect. Because God, if we neglect a quiet time, if we neglect just quietness, if we if we neglect ourselves in the wrong way, then the joy of Christmas will be stolen from us as well. And Lord, there's no greater focus in this time than you. Jesus, you are the reason that we celebrate. And I thank you so much, Jesus, for coming so long ago as a baby and stepping into this world for us. And today, we keep you number one. We keep you right up front. We say, Jesus, you're the reason. We honor you and we praise you. We bless your name. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for loving us. And Lord, I pray that nothing this Christmas season eats or steals our joy. But God, that we do what it's gonna take by keeping Jesus first, others second, and ourselves last. We praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen.